the parts, getting some sense of their history, the design behind them, and had a wonderful day with wonderful people. So thank you guys. So what I'd like to do is uh, dance slightly across the tip of the iceberg, icebergs, and talk about a, a number of subjects this evening, uh, springboarding off of what Melina just presented, and really talk about how ecosystems have changed on the landscape that we see today, and how we might learn from the historic nature of ecosystems that were on the landscape, this landscape historically, and, and inform our future design from that historic performance of the ecosystems that were here historically. Uh, one of the most important things that we start with as scientists is we try to understand the ecological systems that were present and their historic functions. And the larger relationships of the watershed scale, the relationship of a watershed to a river, the relationship between the river and the coastal environment, all have really important understandings that we need to be aware of. The, the watershed is, I'm, I'm going to go quickly, it's the zone of carbonaceous material generation, and the river is the zone of mobility, the zone where materials are broken down that are generated in the watershed. So trees that fall, insects that die, all sorts of life that's created on the larger landscape of the watershed is broken down both in the watershed and in the river and in the hydrologic systems that mobilize and are tributary to the river. The coastal environment is a zone of mixing, a zone of dilution. What's important to realize is that parks are haphazardly scattered across this landscape and don't honor those historic relationships and can't honor those historic relationships because of the nature uh, of the parks and the way they're laid out and we'll talk more about that. It's also important to realize that every decision we make, whether you're making that decision at your church or in your own backyard, impacts potentially the nature of those historic relationships. Uh, whether you're creating impervious landscapes by, by paving over a street or a driveway, or fertilizing your lawn, or uh, watching climate change, or contributing or not contributing to it, Everything we do by default on a watershed scale or at a, at a watershed scale, especially cumulatively, when all sorts of decisions are made, potentially materially impact that functionality of what's called the river continuum, the watershed to river to coastal continuum. Uh, the parks of today are fragmented, isolated ecosystem remnants, and most have lost their historic semblance to the ecosystems of yesteryear. Their fragments are very challenging to manage. It's very, very expensive to manage a fragment of something. It's like taking the, the, the organ of a deer or a buffalo and trying to figure out how to manage that as though we're still part of a functioning deer. It's, it's impossible. In, in actuality, uh, a landscape is not that different, and we're learning about that. Uh, it's more expensive, the, the outcomes are less predictable when we fragment and uh, change the nature of the landscape. Isolation and edge effects impact the ecological system, the opportunity to manage it. And what we're learning is that there's increasing vulnerability from invasive species, hydrologic change, climate change, the whole stochastic events that we're experiencing from rainfall intensification to drought, all of that impacts these wonderful, beloved pieces of property that we call parks. Uh, ecological vulnerability is increasing at the same time that increased recreational demand on these parks is, is occurring. So there's this, there's this really interesting juxtaposition of time, uh, and we need to be aware of that as we begin thinking about the next 50 years, the next 100 years, for the city as a whole, the watersheds that it represents, the river continuums it represents, the coastal environments connected to, and our ambitions and aspirations as a community uh, that participate with this landscape. Uh, what does the park of the future look like? In my opinion, it has to cross all boundaries like water and air and wildlife. It can't be a piece of scraps of parcels that have remained 
from a haphazard, poorly coordinated development scenario. And I'm not chastising Vancouver. This has happened up in every city around the world. We're left with scraps. And we call them parks, and we give them our love and our best ambitions and aspirations for a future. But they're, they really are uh, really disconnected in so many ways. Uh, envision a park system as a fabric of restored lands found throughout the landscape of the watershed. Don't view the park as the place with a park sign in the name. We, we have to expand the vision so that every, public, every pu public and private scrap of land, parcel of land, uh, whether it's love now or, or not, has to be part of the system if we're going to see a park system that actually functionally provides for our own needs and ecological needs in the future. So it's a fabric with private and public lands. It's, it, it's, a, it's a coordination at different scales of time and space. Um, public, ex public expansions in restored public right-of-ways, uh, formal and informal landscapes that are brought into the process, restored landscapes where landowners in their own yard decide that they are interested in contributing to this larger picture, not, not doing something on their own property that might detract from the larger opportunity. Uh, I'll give you examples of these uh, ideas. What we're learning is that uh, where we create this cohesive and coordinated effort, we create communities of conservation. And I can tell you firsthand that the community and the people living in these places are completely different in the way they interact. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So my, my job this evening is to give you some examples where pieces of this puzzle are being put together, have been put together, they're functioning successfully, and also give you some inkling of some of the other facets of these projects. I want you to understand, for example, when we design Ecologically, we typically save anywhere from 5 to 54 percent on the cost of the project. We've got probably 400 projects conventionally designed, ecologically designed, and then constructed ecologically, and the cost savings are outrageously uh, off the balance sheet of most of the developers that we've worked with. They're saving money, and the market premiums are even better. I'll give you examples. And we could talk about affordability, if you'd like, because that's competing with what I just said. So, as a scientist, I've had the honor and pleasure of working all over the world studying the healthiest ecosystems on the planet. And not enough time to take you through that this evening. I'll tell you that I've learned four things. And by the way, this is an 1828 watercolor painting hanging in the National Gallery in Washington, Washington D.C of right where I live in southern Wisconsin. And not enough time to take you through the details, but the landscape was a vast expanse of diverse wetlands and prairies and savannas, very different than where I'm at now. And I know that. I'm giving you another example to give you a sense of how what you've experienced here and are, will be experiencing is not much different than what's occurring uh, in many places elsewhere on the planet. So what we've learned studying the healthiest ecosystems, whether it be the, the Yukon and the, the Arctic, uh, tundra regions of, 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 of the Northwest Territories, or none of it, or the Yukon, uh, or the prairies and savannas uh, where I live, is that the, the healthiest example or rep representative remaining examples of healthiest ecosystems on the planet all exhibit diverse, dynamic, productive, and stingy uh, capacities. Diversity is expressed at all scales, from the different plant and animal species, the genetic diversity present, so different, different phenotypes uh, and representing different genotypes, uh, different plant communities, plant associations. The dynamicism is expressed at all levels. Uh, when there's an unusual drought period, a period of unusual drought, uh, Drought-adapted species come right out of the plant animal communities and do just fine. In urban Chicago, during a drought like you had this year, it was 4,000 acres of lawn that died 
the last drought they had in Chicago. Nothing came up. Uh, they had to replant, they chose to replant the lawns. That's not dynamic. That's a system that's you know entirely uh, supported by our activities. Productive, I always, I, I go to the little restaurant in our farming community right now and the farmers are harvesting corn and soybeans and they, they call my wife and I the weed farmers because we've planted our 80 acre farm to prairie and wetland and savanna and orchards and gardens. And whenever they say, ha ha ha, you don't grow anything but weeds, I say, well, we actually grow a lot of life. And you can measure yours in the number of bushels of corn, we can measure ours in the tons of life per acre. And I guarantee there's a lot more life uh, on our land than there is on your land. And they always, ha ha ha, but you can't sell it at the market. <laughs> Stinginess is one of those factors that um, when we, we started studying ecosystems and how, started studying the hydrology of ecosystems back in the 70s, my mentor and professor was Dr. Luna Leopold, Eldo Leopold's son, and I asked him a dumb question. I was reading journals of settlers moving across the, the Midwestern prairies, and they never mentioned rivers in the 1800s, the late 1700s. They called them morasses and swamps and anything but rivers. And now on a road map where they said it was a morass, whatever that was, now there's rivers. It turns out that the healthiest ecosystems hold on to water and hold on to nutrients. And I'll give you some examples how we've taken advantage of that principle. So ecosystem restoration, in my simplest definition, is about rebuilding the stinginess of landscapes. So landscapes hang on to water and hang on to nutrients, and that is done by creating diverse, dynamic, and productive systems. Uh-oh, I don't know what happened, but, uh, but this slide is so very important because this is where I live, but it's more important to you because this is where most of your beer and bratwurst and cheese comes from if you're a connoisseur of those things. Uh, magnificent contour agriculture, big investments in, in contour farming and other uh, agricultural conservation practices. But as beautiful as this landscape is, it's lost its stingy, stinginess. And it's lost most of its diverse, dynamic, and productive capacity. The, the productivity is shunted through corn and soybeans. It's lost most of its topsoil. Uh, and of course, flying into O'Hare Airport, this is a, a landscape where if a dog takes a leak on the parking lot, the detention pond goes up five feet. That's a joke. Um, it, everything that falls on the property, on the land, is exported as a waste product, whether it be dog turds or bubble gum. These are systems that do not honor the value of important resources. Maybe a bubble gum wrapper or dog turd isn't a good example. Maybe you're not getting it, but the stinginess is gone from this system. I, I don't know what in the heck. We're going to be playing ping pong here. Uh, everything we do on the uplands affects the lowland environment, whether it be a pond that I grew up near in northern Illinois, which has six to ten feet of sediment, and you can see the invasive aquatic plant, European milfoil, uh, Myriophyllum spicatum, uh, very expensive to even begin to hit the undo button, to dredge, to remove sediment, and so forth. Uh, what most people don't recognize are, are the ecological changes that are occurring right in front of our eyes. This is the exact same place photographed with a, a five-year time lapse. Image on the left, 150 to 200 native vascular plant species in a wetland type called the sedge meadow. Uh, that's the exact same site after a development went in with ineffective erosion sedimentation control. Two to four feet of sediment washed in over a period of about five years. We went in with D7s and D8 caterpillar bulldozers, you know, and we removed the substrate down to what we could identify as the historic wetland substrate surface. And because ecosystems have seed banks, they have turians, bulbs, seeds, spores, rhizomes, uh, alive and viable for some period of time in the soil system, by reestablishing the soil surface elevation, removing the sediment, we were able to stimulate the seed bank, and about 95% of the species you see on the left there come back from the seed bank. Uh -oh. 
There is a whole range of, of issues that we're running into in urban areas. The image on the left is separated from the image on the right by a two-track dirt road, a farm road. And on the far side of the image on the left is a railroad track. Uh, for 150 years, the railroad has spawned wildfires. Fires of sparks that have been set by the railroad moving over the rail. And that fire has spread from left to right and it stopped at that farm road. And healthiest example of a tall grass savanna, an oak savanna that we have in the Midwest is what we see on the left. In fact, while most people won't really care about it, uh, we discovered a new species of spider not known to science. Most people would say, got rid of that one. <laughs> but this was about an inch long wolf spider, beautiful big spider, that we only know it from that site. It's never been pre previously or since identified elsewhere. Um, on the right is what happens where invasive shrubs, in this case European buckthorn, Rhamnus catharticus, comes in. It forms a dense understory beneath the big majestic bur oak trees, which are 195 to about 275 year old trees, beautiful big trees. And in the dense shade beneath the buckthorn, we're measuring 30 to 50 tons of soil loss per acre per year. And with that goes the insurance policy, the seed bank. The seed bank that if we remove the buckthorn in, in a variety of ways, would come back and help us restore that system. Uh -oh. uh, this is a publication from the, from the 80s that we, or early 90s that we did, that showed the healthiest examples on the far left. I had about 300 vascular plant species, native plant species, wildflower sedges and grasses, and about 28 breeding bird species in about a 30-acre site. When the, when the invasive shrubs came in in the 1970s, I think there might be a pointer here, uh, um, we started having the, the number of breeding bird species down to about 15, and the vascular plant species was cut by about, down to about a sixth. And what's happening now is the acorns from the big, big oaks you know, are falling into the dense shade, and the acorns don't have adequate quantity or quanti quality of light. They're beginning, they're imbibing, and they're beginning uh, to germinate, and then they die because of that inadequate quality and quantity of light. So what's left is this invasive shrub layer and uh, the breeding bird species remaining include European buckthorn, I'm sorry, European starling, which has the ability to detoxify an alkaloid in European buckthorn. It co-evolved with the European buckthorn plant in uh, Europe. Uh, quite in contrast to what Smokey the Bear Tri is teaching us in the U.S., we've been burning these savannas, these forests, and completely re rejuvenating, revitalizing all those stormwater management functions. These are infiltration-driven systems. They typically, historically, other than under frozen conditions, we have something called ice and snow where I come from, other than under those conditions, these systems did not discharge stormwater. They infiltrated even rare event storms, and we've got evidence that we can share with you. So here's one of the, one of the important things that began to teach me about landscape hydrology. Uh, when I was talking to Luna Leopold in the 70s about rivers and saying we didn't have rivers historically, and now we have these deeply entrenched and laterally dynamic and unstable systems, uh, he said, go find data you young, inspiring ecologist, and bring me data. I, otherwise, this is nonsense. So it turned out in, in, in 1904 in the US Supreme Court, there was a series of uh, litigated projects, and this is one of them near Chicago, where a power company put a dam across a watershed, a river, called the Des Plaines River, illustrated in yellow. This is uh, 628 square miles, about 400,000 acres of land in yellow the predecessor of a real friendly sounding agency, uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers, the predecessor was called the Department of War, sued that power company and said your dam is illegal because it's uh, blocking an navigable waterway. And there's about a 22 year daily 
in certified engineering record of the amount of water, the discharge from this particular watershed. And I summarize that, and I'm just going to dance even lighter here. This is a duration flow curve that tells you what percentage of the time from that watershed the discharge was at or above a given level of discharge. And I'm just going to, if you walk down to the river in the year of 1899, 50% of the time, if you went down to the river, about four cubic feet per second were coming out of, the, out of this 428,000 acre watershed. You guys are probably metric, and I won't convert it to cubic meters for you here. Sorry. But uh, four cubic feet per second is around 32 gallons a second. At, at that time, the landscape in 1899 was vast prairies and wetlands and savannas and forest remnants. And then in the early 1900s, just a few years later, really, uh, agricultural activities came in. Uh, German farmers, my relatives, came in and started installing underground tile systems to drain the wet lands, and they started ditching the, the, the streams. And this is actually 1900, each of the blue dots, it's going to be a, 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 an eye test here. Hopefully you see those blue dots. Uh, each of the blue dots is a farmhouse that was present as of that year. Hopefully you've noticed that there's more blue dots in the 1950s. <laughs> if not, your blood sugar is low. Um, and by 1999, if the eye test is really working, you'll you, you see there's a lot more blue dots. And at that time, large areas of the, wa of the watershed were urbanized and suburbanized. And at that time, if you went to the same duration flow curve and looked at the, the median, 50 percentile red cross, uh, around 780 cubic feet per second is coming out of that water was coming out of that watershed. So from a, a, a mean, a median of around four cubic feet per second to about 780 cubic feet per second. And what I've eliminated from this is all the groundwater, the permitted groundwater pumping that's taking groundwater like from a line of quarry and dewatering the quarry, dumping it into the river. So this is just meant to understand the land use change, uh, runoff changes, if that makes sense to you guys. The river used to be at grade, now it's in some places 20 to 30 feet below grade. So that's some of the science that I wanted to share with you. These changes have occurred everywhere on the planet that's been urbanized and everywhere on the planet that's been subject to agricultural activities and large landscape changes. We do a natural resource inventory. Uh, and nowadays, we're able to map down to about a, 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 a centimeter on the ground, multispectral, hyperspectral, pixel size, and we're mapping individual plant species at that scale, with that resolution, over large acreages, and doing it relatively inexpensively. The next thing we do on projects uh, is establish the, an overlay of parks, trails, and greenways. And lastly, we begin overlaying the built environment. Where should development go? Where should it not go? And if there's development that's occurring, how might that be retrofitted to accommodate uh, stormwater and a number of other uh, benefits that we're trying to achieve? So here's an example. This is just a couple square miles. Um, hopefully you can see there's yellow polygons with little alphanumeric codes in each. This is an example where we said everything within these uh, green, blue, red, yellow buffers are important natural resources that need to be protected. And one way to start a conversation with the community was to say, let's put up to 200 foot buffers around the outside of all of these important natural areas. Now that doesn't solve any problem if you've got something like, a, like an agricultural ditch running perpendicular to the buffer and bringing uh, agricultural runoff right into an important natural area like a wetland or a lake. We then started looking at how to incorporate trails within those buffers. That's what the red line show. And we started the, the idea of let's establish parks within that landscape. And that's what the green systems are you see here. I'm trying to get this to advance. Uh, this community was worrying about its future because of the 3,000 acres of natural lakes in their community. 
and the deteriorating water quality in those lakes from agricultural and land development. And uh, sorry about the color, baby poop brown, I guess. I don't know what you call that. But uh, what we proposed was that this whole area that you see in whatever that color is really had to be protected. And their master plan for their city, for their township, really had to offer a series of solutions. So, for example, if development was going to occur in these areas, they really had to take and only use infiltration, no overland runoff from the developments at all, all the way up to the 100-year design storm event. And it completely changes the way one thinks uh, and, and, and designs uh, when you have to have a completely maintained infiltrative driven system rather than a you know, detention ponds and, and storm sewers and so forth. Here's another example. This is a, a city uh, embedded in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a pretty hip place, um, where the city had um, a major flooding problem. And the proposal that was designed by the design engineers was to put a 90-inch diameter pipe that took water from the flooded area directly into a beloved lake called Lake Mendota. And nobody wanted that. The other reason nobody wanted it, because it went right through uh, First Nation Indian mountains and a whole series of other heritage and cultural areas. And we were brought in, we designed these stormwater management principles, which were focused on using ecology rather than the engineering solutions. What the heck? We, we designed a, a, a way to look at frequent events, rare events, look at storage, and look at water quality, uh, and uh, really prevent the problem, the deterioration of Lake Mendota. We started the process. So this was an example where everybody said the only solution was a 90-inch diameter you know, $15 million pipe, and they didn't have any way to value the First Nation uh, artifacts, uh, the archaeology. It, was, it wasn't even part of the conversation. We said, if you look at the watershed that's tributary, there's all sorts of public land in that area. There's public right-of-ways and, and boulevard medians. There's church properties. There's school grounds. Let's take a look at what each of those properties might offer. <coughs> in terms of addressing the flood damage reduction needs. And we started putting together conceptual plans, us ecologists, and then the engineers on our team said, let's convert this into a model and, and eliminate, to deduct what we could store and deduct the, the, you know, the volume reduction, deduct the, 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 the release rates, and look at the benefits. And I'm not going to take much time and take you through this. But it turned out this was a buried stream, a wonderful stream that was in a, a, a 10 foot wide by 5 foot high box culvert underground. And we said, let's bring it back to the surface and celebrate this wonderful stream. The conclusions basically was that we had more than enough public space without impacting the function of the public space. To use that public space, it would cost about $25,000 to $50,000 per acre foot. But with smaller dispersed systems across this landscape, we could solve the problems that they were having with flooding. Um, here's a project. I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish, and I don't want to pretend to understand Catholicism, but I want to give you an example of a project. So here was a church that had been in place for years and years and years, over 100 years, and they decided to build a new cathedral but because the church was never uh, properly designed for stormwater management controls, the whole new, the new church, the cathedral, and the old church now had to, in order for them to put the development in, they had to put stormwater controls in for everything. And the design engineer proposed a 12-foot deep detention pond, the drop-off point to go to the new cathedral was right there, it was a, a catwalk, and the parishioners were so nervous when they saw this, it'd be like me standing next to a 12 foot hole, walking to the church. It cost an additional $2 million to build that and fortify the foundation of the church. 
and we said, how many gutter downspouts do you have? And looked at the, the existing building and the proposed building, and I think there were 10, is it 10 stations that across? Anybody cap up here? 12, 12, thank you, 12 gutter downspouts. We said, let's build 12, 12 rain gardens associated one with each, with each, with each downspout. We saved uh, like about 90% of the $2 million, and the church parishioners made each of these a station of the cross and built these wonderful gardens, and we solved their stormwater problem for a couple hundred thousand dollars and got everything through retrofitted and got the permitting done. Just a different way of thinking. Uh, wonderful little rain gardens with little stations of the cross where people sit and luxuriate in their spirituality and enjoy the flowers and the butterflies. Uh, here's a project that may be very applicable to the discussion that we're having here. Uh, the question, this is from Milwaukee, a three million acre uh, urban landscape. How can every dollar spent on green infrastructure also be an investment in new parks and open space? How can green infrastructure design, designers, engineers, park designers, and colleges work together to create a solution rather than everybody working in their own disciplines? How can ecological design save significant costs on the infrastructure, saving capex, opex, and operations and maintenance uh, money? And how can this result in an increased park investment? So here's the, the green infrastructure originally was called Green Fingers, and it was a way to rebuild a landscape of small scale to medium scale to large scale restoration projects that solve a major flooding problem in Milwaukee. Uh, here's an example of the of Milwaukee downtown of Sierra. This is about 35 miles north, and here's the watersheds. What we found was 28,000 acres of historic wetlands that are now drained, tile and ditch drained, and used for agriculture. And we said, why don't we take uh, about 6,000 acres of those and restore those as wetland. And it turned out that cost about $150 million by the land or by the easements. And when we modeled it, we were solving about 90% of the flood damage reduction needs in the downtown metropolitan area. All the rivers come right through the downtown area. Uh, Milwaukee spent $2.5 billion and solved about 43% of the flood damage reduction needs uh, with a deep tunnel system, which hasn't been working. They keep having raw manure, raw human manure spills in the Lake Michigan. And there's hundreds of millions of dollars for the lawsuits resulting from these raw discharges, CSO discharges. So now Milwaukee has floated the bond money, and they're, I think they're up to 2,000 acres of the 6,000 that they've purchased, and they're beginning the restoration process. So instead of $90,000 per acre foot, it's costing about $12,000 an acre foot. And instead of investing 150, 200, 300 feet below ground in some high maintenance tunnel, uh, they're investing in land and restoring land, which also becomes parkland at about one tenth the cost. They're removing, they're daylighting streams, removing concrete channels uh, that they were, were put in the 1930s through the 50s, and creating these wonderful open spaces that are available now for people. Using stormwater treatment trains, all sorts of the, whoa, that's wild. All sorts of the businesses are, and, and schools are using this at different scales. So instead of high maintenance lawns, this is the new South Milwaukee School. US EPA give, gave this an award for alternative stormwater management deployment. Uh, all of the, the, the parking lot, many parking lots in the area and other developments are doing the same. Uh, there are some really high density environments where below parking lot storage is being put in place. One of the interesting things we've been learning about is how do you take these high maintenance parks? Parks in Milwaukee are mowed lawns, a lot of them. And there's a lot of them if you've ever been to Summerfest in Milwaukee. Uh, they're spending about $12,000 per acre per year mowing lawns 22 times and aerating lawns. 
Uh, what we've learned is that we can convert those, and I'll show you this in a second, uh, to native grassland, wildflower, savanna, forest, wetland systems, and the maintenance cost is about $50 to $100 per year per acre. We're taking areas where the mowers continuously damage trees. You know, they bang into trees, and the trees don't live too long. They don't appreciate getting banged in, apparently. We're converting those to native vegetation. We're taking obvious challenging places that shouldn't be mowed in the first place and converting them. We're taking areas that were large landscapes of lawn and making them very deliberate and restoring those to native vegetation. So it turns out if you do a break-even analysis, at, even a, at, the, at a low cost for restoration, or an average cost, the break-even is about a three-year period. If you don't need any additional capital if you're managing and maintaining your park property and mowing it you know, the way they do 12 times a year, 20 times a year. Uh, you can use the O&M money, the operation <laughs> maintenance money, to transition about 10% of the park or more every year into native vegetation. And then after about year three, the maintenance costs go way down. And we've cash flowed with break-evens of three years or break-evens with more elaborate restorations at about eight years. And this is allowing some park districts to transition large acreages very quickly with no additional capital needs, which is what this says, if I can advance it. So here's something I want to share with you for Kansas City. This is a three million acre area, seven counties, if I recall. This is natural resource, or natural area mapping, natural area mapping down to one meter square on the ground for three million acres. This is a summary of all the lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands, floodplain, floodways on that three million acre area. Here's all the high quality upland ecosystems, barrens, uh, uh, savannas, different prairie ecosystem types, glades, and other ecosystem types. Here's the two of those put together. And the red dots were known important endangered and threatened species locations. Here's all the parks and open space. It turned out only 6% of the most important natural resources in the whole metro area were captured by the parks and the greenway systems. So 94% of what was important in the natural systems wasn't captured. So we decided how could we begin to expand the metro green and the park system? Uh, how could we contemplate a future where we picked up a larger percentage of the most important valuable resources? And we made, uh oh, you can change. We made one policy change that's been adopted in all seven counties. We said 100 foot top of bank out into the adjacent landscape. We want to protect those drink, every drainage way, even, even buried drainage ways. So drainage, historic drainage ways that are underground. We want, to, we want to honor the memory of those locations and all existing drainage ways, 200 foot basically a 200 foot buffer uh, centered over the stream, centered over the, the ravines. Every county has unanimously passed this as policy. One policy change immediately protected 91,000 acres of land in Kansas City. The other important thing that this did is it gave the city and every county uh, access across private property to maintain these stream systems and restore the landscape the savannas and other vegetation along these stream systems. Here's a project uh, that was a HUD project, Housing Urban Development Agency in our country. They forgot to take geotechnical coring borings when they designed the development in the 60s. They only went down 15 feet. It was a buried landfill from about 15 to 30 feet down. And after about 20 years of const after constructing this, everything started falling apart. So we said, um, let's bring the stream that was down 32 feet back to the surface. And that was physically impossible and economically impossible. But we created the memory of that stream at the surface. This became the central organizing feature for redeveloping. That's the new development called Heritage Park. And we created 
so the new stream is all the stormwater coming in from adjacent lateral stormwater systems, and it's the new stormwater landing on the several hundred acres of property. And it's a wonderful little stream that flows in the Mississippi River, and it's, it's, it's central organizing feature for reinvestment of this development. It's worked real well. Well, here's uh, a couple projects that you're probably familiar with. This is the Don River Project in Toronto. We're part of the design team. We're at the first ever redevelopment or redesign of a new river mouth on a large body of water, in this case, uh, Lake Ontario, was designed. This hasn't been constructed yet, but this is a remarkable project. I think the mayor's now gone, the nasty mayor, well, you guys might think differently about that mayor. Uh, I think he's now gone, he, he put a stay on this project, but it looks like the project's uh, slowly moving forward to develop the Donlands with this large central organizing river mouth and a large park. Here's what the river looks like. Uh, an awful lot of analysis went into that, including historic analysis to understand what the river used to be like. And then we did reference area analysis of local rivers, began to articulate the different water sources, polluted uh, runoff from uh, you know contaminated urban areas, clean rooftop water, clean water from other sources, and began appropriating those in the new, new design to create the wetlands that folks wanted along the Don. Uh, we used uh, what I saw today, silver cells, which I had never heard of before this project, and created a half-life for the trees and the streetscape that was probably longer than five years, maybe, maybe ten times more than that. We began looking at the improvements in, uh, in the wildlife, and, the, and this is historic, a representation of what used to be on the land. This is present condition. And these were the improvements we expected with the dark green symbols. Uh, for every group of wildlife, we did a, 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 a separate plan, the mammal plan, the frog plan. It was really an interesting process. So let me race through. This is a project that some folks have heard about. It's a 700-acre project north of Chicago called Prey Crossing, where we basically threw out all the best management practices all the stormwater management controls required by policy and regulation in the U.S. and in Illinois and in Lake County, Illinois. And we said, let's design the stormwater management system around using ecology, restored ecological systems. And the first thing we recognized is uh, all the engineered systems are produce predictably unpredictable hydrograph. <laughs> and that's not good if you're an ecologist or if you're a frog or a fish interested in predictable hydrographs. This is nature's hydrograph, predictable seasonal high, and a trajectory toward a seasonal low. And on the left is what we find coming out of darn near every engineered system. Small lots, in this case, 4,000 to 10,000 square foot lots, organized around, and that's, that's the olive green, organized around large open space systems. Uh, here's a view. Deep-rooted native plants that really, really have increased the infiltration. Some people have used uh, formal native landscaping. Others have said, screw it, I'm never going to mow my lawn again. And they planted their whole yard with wildflowers. So what we did on this project, just by changing the design thinking, is we reduced the 100-year peak by 100-year flood peak by over 70 percent, and we saved uh, about 30 percent of the cost. No storm sewers, no curbs and gutters, no detention ponds, and wonderful nature, and uh, trails and agriculture. And here's another project. Uh, this is an 8,000-acre project with the Nature Conservancy. Um, and I'll just go through it quick. This is a square mile, the black inset. I just don't know how to make square slides. It's not supposed to be rectangular like that. This is These are the legal ditches that, and, and encumbrances. Uh, this is a, the square mile on the center pivot irrigation trace, you can see. There's the tile system under that square mile. We did seed bake analysis, put a restoration plan together, phased the plan, began the construction, uh, seeded it with about 340 native species locally collected 
Uh, so they use this Christ machine, which is what I call it. It walks on water, literally, and receded every 48 seconds.